Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is a very tragic, awful situation that I feel escalated so freaking quickly. It all happened so fast and so suddenly and it's just wild how all of this turned out. I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you guys think about this case after hearing the details. But before we get into it, real quick, I want to thank each and every one of you who stopped by to say hey to me last weekend at CrimeCon. It was my first CrimeCon experience and you guys made it so amazing. I loved watching the different presentations, demonstrations, and learning so much about cases that I've covered as well as cases that I've never heard of before. It was such an amazing experience and I cannot wait for next year and I hope to see you all there. With that being said, let's get into today's case. Twin sisters Brittany and Tiffany Coughlin were born March 14th, 2000 to Anjum and Randall Kaufman. Anjum was originally from Pakistan before she immigrated to the U.S. with her family back in 2012. She was the third of four children to her parents and they were a deeply religious Muslim family. When Anjum was 17 years old, she was working at a local discount store when she met her soon-to-be husband, Randy, who was 19 at the time, and the two started dating. Now, because of their religious beliefs, Anjum was not allowed to date, so when her parents found out that she had been dating, they pretty much disowned her. They stopped communication with her. It was when Anjum was 18 years old that she decided to leave the family home and go live with Randy, again, because the family disowned her. From there, they got married and settled in the Chicagoland area in Illinois. After 10 years of marriage, Randy and Anjum welcomed their twin daughters into the world and they couldn't be happier. Now, although the girls were twins, those who knew them said that they were total opposites. Tiffany was a more introverted, reserved girl who took school very seriously. She was shy, and it was only after getting to know someone that she would open up to them and come out of her shell. She was an AP student in high school, she got straight A's, and she had dreams of becoming a veterinarian. For the time being, while in high school, she worked at a local pet store to gain experience caring for animals. She tended to gravitate towards animals even more than people, mostly because she saw the animals as creatures that give unconditional love and couldn't do anything to hurt somebody. But she was also a lover of music and she loved fashion. Before her death, she was also training to do a marathon. Meanwhile, Brittany was outgoing, vibrant, and extroverted. She was on the cheerleading team and did gymnastics. She was the type of girl who wanted to be friends with everybody, and she made friends very easily. She was working in a bakery department at a local grocery store at the time, but she had dreams of going into the hospitality industry when she grew up. This totally made sense because it really fit her outgoing personality. She absolutely loved life and had dreams of traveling the world. The two girls originally attended Oswego High School as freshmen before they moved to St. Charles and attended St. Charles East High School where they were juniors. However, the marriage between Anjum and Randy was not the most stable or loving as you could have probably guessed by now. From the time that the girls were little, Anjum and Randy knew that they just did not work. Within their first few weeks of dating, Randy demanded that Anjum convert to Christianity and being young and naive, again, she was only 17 or 18 at the time, she did just that. And from there, things got progressively worse. Anjum brought up divorce many times throughout the years, but they always ended up staying together for the sake of their girls. Randy was described as being controlling and one of those people where if he was in a bad mood, Everybody had to know it, and everybody else around him had to do something about it. Anjum always felt like she was walking on eggshells around him. Now, Randy was the main breadwinner of the family. He worked as a network manager for a mid-sized Chicago law firm, while Anjum only had a side job, working part-time as a claims adjuster at MetLife in Aurora. So, anytime Anjum would bring up the idea of splitting up, Randy would threaten to quit his job and stop providing for them, and basically said that they would be out of luck. Like I mentioned earlier, Anjum left her family home after her parents disowned her when she originally started dating Randy. Anjum originally thought that after a week, or maybe a month, or at worst, after a year, 
that her family would come around and welcome her back. But unfortunately, even after all of those years, her family never got back into contact with her. They went 25 years without as much as contacting Anjum, not ever wanting to meet her granddaughters, which is truly unfortunate. But because of that, she really didn't have any support outside of Randy. So she really wanted to try and make things work between them. She also knew that Randy's support allowed them to live a very comfortable life. And other than his controlling behaviors, things weren't all that bad. They did try couples therapy and tried to work on their issues, but as time went on, again, things only got worse. Randy continued to grow more and more controlling to the point that Anjum couldn't do pretty much anything without Randy getting mad at her. She couldn't spend any amount of money without asking first. Literally, he would get mad if she spent $2 without telling him what it was for first. She wasn't allowed to do anything for her appearance, including getting her nails done, and she was only allowed to get the ends of her hair trimmed once per year. So if she wanted to go with a new style, if she wanted to chop, if she wanted to get layers, that was not allowed. Anjum would later say that over the course of her marriage, his personality completely changed. He grew an ego, a big one. He knew that he was supporting the family. He knew that Anjum didn't really have a way out. Everybody in the house listened to him and wouldn't do anything without asking him first. So this ego of his just grew bigger and bigger. But even with that being said, I do want to note that Anjum always said that Randy loved his girls. He never did anything to hurt them. In fact, he doted over them and spoiled them. Randy would even get mad if Anjum tried disciplining her girls because he basically thought that his girls could do no wrong. It seemed that the controlling behaviors and the possessiveness was really only towards Anjum. Then by 2015, Randy was diagnosed with depression and started taking antidepressants to deal with his symptoms. And over the years, his dosages grew higher and he began drinking excessively. Things grew progressively from there to the point that even Tiffany and Brittany's friends noticed that they weren't acting themselves at school. Brittany especially, her friend said that she tried her best to put out a strong front, but you could tell that she was struggling. Her grades were falling and she told friends that she was having a hard time finishing her assignments because her home life just was not good. Then, by February of 2017, after 28 years of marriage, 46-year-old Anjum and 48-year-old Randy decided that it was best if they went their separate ways. This decision was described as a mutual one, with both parties seemingly okay with it. The girls were now old enough to understand, and with how miserable Anjum was, she felt that this was the perfect time to finally leave. The two sat Tiffany and Brittany down to let them know that they were separating, as this would be the most stable situation for everybody. At the time, the twins were not surprised in the slightest. They could tell that their parents weren't happy together and hadn't been for a very long time. As a family, they had lived on the fourth floor of a three-bedroom luxury condo in St. Charles. After the separation, Anjum was the one who moved out to a one-bedroom condo just down the street from Randy, also in St. Charles, Illinois. Anjum felt that this was the best decision at the time. She thought that the girls would be much happier staying with their dad in the condo that they had been living in for over a year. And besides, Anjum was excited to have her own place. She never really had a space to call her own, so she was really excited to decorate her new condo and have the freedom to be by herself. There was never any real concern for her daughter's safety because, again, all throughout the marriage, even though Anjum wasn't happy and Randy was controlling of her, as far as I have seen, he's never hurt the kids or even Anjum. Those who lived near Randy and the twins also said that they would see Randy interacting with the girls when they were out and about. They were always seen laughing and smiling with their father, always seeming comfortable and happy. However, Randy's controlling behaviors towards Anjum did not stop after she moved out. Despite Brittany and Tiffany asking to see their mother, Randy forbid them from seeing her unless he was present. 
I don't exactly know why, but it seems like that was more of just like a control thing. Like, you don't get to see her unless I'm there with you. By Thursday, March 9th, 2017, Randy went over to Anjum's new place to talk and drink some wine together. At that time, Randy told Anjum that he wanted to get back together and he wanted to try to fix things between them. But Anjum told Randy that things between them were over. She wanted a divorce and there wasn't really anything that he could do to change her mind. She wanted to be honest and she was. She was honest with her feelings and she told him exactly how she felt about the situation. Then by Friday, March 10th, 2017, Anjum had been at work when she started receiving concerning messages from Randy. He texted her that he wanted to kill himself. Then later in the afternoon that same day, Randy contacted Anjum again saying that he had secrets too before inviting her over that night so that he could show her his secrets. But Anjum told Randy no, telling him to just tell her over the phone, but he refused. He insisted that she was only to find out once she came over, and he also said that he had paperwork for her, so she had to come over to get that as well. That same evening, by around 4.45 p.m., a neighbor reported seeing Randy and a woman who she thought was Anjum walking up the stairs to the unit. This neighbor had never actually seen Anjum before. She didn't know if this was Randy's wife, but she sort of deduced that it was. The neighbor said that it looked like the pair were in a hurry since Randy was walking up two or three steps at a time, but they didn't look like they were arguing and it didn't seem like anything was wrong at the time. While at the apartment at that time, Anjum said that the call she got from Randy did scare her but she ended up going to his apartment to see what this was all about and again, to get those papers that he told her about. When Anjum entered the apartment, she noticed that Brittany was lying on the couch. She was turned away from the TV, which was playing Friends, one of Brittany's favorite TV shows. It looked like Brittany was sleeping, but she was very still, which did stand out to Anjum as being odd. Then, Anjum went into the kitchen to look for the papers that Randy was talking about, so she was turned towards, like, the drawers and the counter, but as soon as she turned back around, she saw that Randy was standing right behind her, holding a gun to his head. Of course, she was in shock and disbelief, and she told him to stop, that he would wake up Brittany. But he told Anjum that Brittany and Tiffany were already dead. At the time, she only saw Brittany. She didn't see Tiffany, but Brittany was not moving, so it was pretty obvious what had happened. He then pointed the gun at Anjum's head, but he said that he wanted her to live so that she could suffer from this. Then he moved the gun down and shot her leg, with the bullet passing through both of her thighs. After shooting his wife, Randy then took the gun and ran into a bedroom, closing the door and locking it behind him. At that same time, 911 received multiple calls to report a shooting. One person that called was a neighbor directly below Randy's fourth floor unit who reported hearing nothing at first, no talking, no arguing, until he heard a loud boom at around 4.30 p.m. Then, about 10 to 15 minutes later, he heard more unusual noises, but he wasn't exactly sure what to make of them. He did recall hearing what sounded like a child screaming around that same time, but he wasn't too sure. The neighbor said that he knew that the family had lived in the unit for about a year and a half and never noticed any issues, never heard any yelling or arguments or anything like that they seemed like a normal family. Then, at the same time, 911 received two more calls, one from Randy himself and another from Anjum. In Randy's 911 call, before the dispatcher even answers, you can hear Randy saying, I want you to live and suffer like I did. Then, when the dispatcher answers, Randy calmly says, I shot my two kids, I shot my wife, and now I'm going to kill myself too. I want you to live and suffer like I did. 911. I just shot and killed my two kids, and I shot my wife. And I'm going to shoot myself now. What, well, sir, what address are you at? What? What address are you at? 450 four, South First Street, St. Charles, Unit 406. Yeah. I'm going to kill myself now, too. My two sir, girls sir, are sir, dead, sir, and I'm killing sir. myself. Sir, 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 sir. All right, so 450 South First Street in St. Charles? Sir, sir, family.
the line with me. Okay, ma'am. Sir. Hello? I just heard a sign in the back. Sir. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. I got no voice back right now. Then Anjum called 911 as well to report that her daughters had been shot, and so had she. I will warn you that Anjum's call is very intense. She is screaming out in pain, and you can just hear the shock and devastation and heartbreak and her just trying to figure out what is going on as she is screaming. She knows that her daughters are dead. And she's trying to explain what happened to the dispatcher. She's trying to process everything at the same time. But God, it is truly awful to listen to. The call is about five to seven minutes long, depending on how I edit it down. But just to warn you, it is, again, very intense. So if you want to skip ahead about five minutes, if it gets to be too much for you, totally understandable. I couldn't listen to the full thing at first when I first heard it because it really, really was that hard to listen to. Again, she's just screaming out. It's just, it's such a devastating call to hear. I don't know. Please, come here now. Where do you need help at? St. Charles. Where in St. Charles? Oh my God, my husband shot my kids. Okay, shot I need me. to know where you are. I can help you, but I need help. Where are you? Now, Flora, say, God, somebody please help me. Oh okay, ma'am, what address are you at? Call 911 now. Ma'am, what address are you at? Oh my God! Ma'am, where are you at? Ma'am, I can help you, but I need to know where you are. Ma'am, I can help you, but I need to know where you're at. Please call 911. Please. I can't remember my address. Okay, could it be 450 South 1st Street? 450 South 1st Street, yes. Okay, what Call apartment? Call ambulances. Okay, we're getting them headed that way. What apartment are you in? 406, my girls are dead. 406? Okay, stay on the phone. I'm going to get an ambulance headed that way. Yep, we're going to be on our way. Don't hang up, okay? <laughs> Okay, ma'am, I'm going to talk to the medics. Don't hang up, okay? I'm going to talk to my girl. I'm going to... Oh, my God. Please. My girl, I'm dead. Oh, my God. Oh, 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 my God, please. please. All right, ma'am, I got medics on their way. Can you confirm the phone number you're calling me from? Ma'am, I got medics on their way, okay? Where's the bad guy at? He's in the back room. And I don't know what he's done. I don't know if he's, he's in the back room. He's in my room. I don't care if you get over here now. My okay, God. they're on their way. My okay. My okay, ma'am. I got medics on their way. I got officers on their way. The offender's in the back room. Ma'am, do you know where the gun is? I don't know if he has it. Please just get over here. I don't want to answer my own question. He shot me. Okay, ma'am. Where are the officers? 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 Where
All right. We got officers coming up now. I need to know where he is. Are you safe where you are? Please, 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 Brittany, 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 Okay, ma'am, are you safe where you are? She shot me. Ma'am, are you safe where you are? Do we know where he is? I'm going into shock. I don't know where he is. Ma'am, are you safe where you are? Do we know where he is? He killed my girls. He fucking killed my girls. Okay, ma'am, and I can help you, but I need you to calm down. Where is he? He's in a vacuum. I don't know what he's done. I don't know if he's doing. Okay, is he still in the apartment? <laughs> Officers coming up now, okay? What's his name? Randy. Randy? What's his last name? I'm going into shock. I'm, I've lost a lot of blood. Okay, ma'am. Is there a way that you can put a clean cloth over the wound and apply direct pressure? Ma'am? Okay, ma'am, was that a police officer there? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to keep you on the phone until, until somebody's able to help you, okay? I don't know, there's a bathroom in there also. Yeah. He killed me. He killed me. He probably lost it. Don't kill him. Don't kill him, please. He might be in the bathroom. Alright, there's a closet in there too. Randy? Ma'am, just stay where you're at, okay? Just try to sit down or lay down and relax, okay? My Officer with you now? I need my girls to be checked. Please check my girls. Please check my girls. One of them is lying. Ma'am, do you have an officer there? Brittany and Tiffany. <laughs> Ma'am, do you have an officer with you? When first responders arrived to the scene, they pretty much described the same from Anjum. They found Anjum sitting on the floor in the main hallway directly in front of the main door leading into her apartment, and she was covered in blood, mostly around her legs. Anjum was just hysterically screaming over and over and over again, saying that he shot her daughters and calling out their names over and over and over again. She kept screaming and asking if her daughters were okay. First responders report that she was in such a state of shock that she couldn't even understand what people were saying to her. All she could get out was that the shooter was still in the home. So officers made their way into the condo until getting into the master bedroom where Anjum told officers Randy was. At the time, they called out to Randy demanding that he come out, but he wasn't answering. So, they kicked down the bedroom door, which again had been locked. He wasn't in the bedroom, so they went and kicked down the bathroom door, which was also locked. When they got into the bathroom, they found Randy, who was lying face down, submerged in blood-soaked water in the bathtub. On the counter in the bathroom, police found a magazine that belonged to a 9mm handgun with bullets still inside. They also found a cell phone, which had 911 dialed in it. They also found a 9mm handgun right next to Randy's body. 
Then they found another 9mm handgun in the closet within the apartment. As officers made their way through the rest of the apartment, again, they found 16-year-old Brittany lying dead on the couch. Her entire body was covered head to toe with a blanket, and it was obvious that she was dead. Then they went inside of one of the bedrooms, and there they found Tiffany dead from a single gunshot wound to her head. Brittany had also been killed by a single gunshot wound to her head. Tiffany had also been covered in her bedsheet from head to toe, and at the times that each girl was shot, it looked like Brittany had been lying on the couch watching TV while Tiffany was lying in her bed watching a video on her laptop. When Tiffany was shot, her head was still on the pillow. There was no sign of a struggle, and it didn't appear that either girl knew what was happening when they were shot. So what we can sort of gather from this is that it seems like Randy called Anjum over to his place with the plan of killing his girls before she got there. Once she agreed and she was on her way, he killed the girls at around 4.30, at the same time that neighbors report hearing booms coming from the apartment. Anjum got there just 10 to 15 minutes later, where he then shot Anjum before turning the gun on himself in that bathroom. It seemed like he had been planning this either from the moment that Anjum told him the night before that they weren't going to be getting back together, or even that next day. It seemed that when he threatened to kill himself, that might not have gotten the reaction that he wanted out of Anjum, so he then took it a step further and threatened even more. And it was earlier in the day that he said, I have secrets that I want you to see, so it seemed like the girls were alive all day, and then right before Anjum got there, that's when he shot them. So he had the idea in his head that he was going to shoot his girls pretty much all day, which to me is even more devastating than just like snapping and like killing his girls in quick succession. The fact that he had the idea in his head all day and then planned this in a way that Anjum would get there to see them before he had the chance to take his own life is just disgusting and despicable. It's, it's so, so sick. After officers found Anjum at the scene, she was rushed to the hospital for treatment for her gunshot wounds. While there, Anjum continued to have difficulty with grasping what had just happened to her and her daughters. She continued to say that Randy had never been violent with them, never showed any red flags that could have predicted this. Now, it did come out about a month before this, police did respond to their condo for a domestic call, but no one in that situation had been physically harmed and no arrests were made. So other than that, there was no history of violence. However, it was also at that time that Anjum remembered that Randy had threatened to kill the kids once or twice before in the past, but she never thought that he was serious. He never acted out or said anything else to or about his daughters that could indicate that he was serious. So it's not like he had been abusing them and physically hurting her and, you know, was threatening the kids all the time and was showing aggressive behaviors towards them. And then he said he's going to kill them. Like, that would be obviously the biggest red flag. But it seemed in this situation, he acted completely normally towards his girls and never showed any sign that he wanted to hurt them except these couple times that he threatened to kill them, which are definitely red flags, but I can kind of understand how Anjum wouldn't take it seriously and never thought that this was anything more than a threat to her. Like, if you don't act a certain way, I'm gonna kill the kids. So she probably was like, okay, I'm just gonna act the way that he wants me to. And it was probably, again, over the course of 28 years. So who knows, the first threat or the second threat could have been 10 years before that. And she didn't even think about it at the time that they were going through their separation. So again, obviously it's a red flag that he had threatened to kill them before, but let's not give her too much flack for not really taking it seriously. I'm sure at this point, it is one of her biggest regrets not taking that threat seriously. So again, she's been through enough. She's been through enough at this point. So either way, at the hospital, Anjum was put on suicide watch. In the week after the deaths of her daughters, she said that she barely remembered anything and the days passed by in a blur. She did make a full recovery from her gunshot wounds, 
but of course, nothing could have prepared her for the mental anguish that she suffered for months and years after the tragic day. She was depressed and she suffered from nightmares in the weeks after the murders. She was basically lost after losing her daughters. She didn't have any other family. Her daughters truly were her entire world and Randy took them away from her. She also said that she made a bunch of decisions that she regrets in the weeks after all the deaths because she truly just was not all there. Time passed by in a blur. She did have Randy buried next to the girls. He originally wanted to be cremated, but she did not allow this. She instead buried him next to the girls so that he could be with them and tell them what he did to them. She chose to have all items in Randy's apartment thrown away, which included her daughter's belongings, which she does now regret. But she did end up staying in the apartment that she moved into after the separation, which does have some of the girl's other belongings, so she does have many other items to remember them by. So it's not like she just got rid of any sign of her daughters whatsoever though she does wish she kept some of their clothes, their journals, and things like that. In the weeks and months after this, she traveled around to San Diego, New York, and Tennessee, but she always returned back to St. Charles, Illinois. She just cannot leave her girls behind. She also has no family, because even after the deaths of her daughters and husband, her family still has not contacted her. The other tragic part of this case is that the girls were murdered just three days before their 17th birthdays. By their 18th birthdays, Anjum threw them a big birthday party, which was attended by over 100 people from their community. Anjum felt that her daughters would have wanted her to carry on after their deaths. They would want her to move forward and heal. Anjum started going back to therapy, she started exercising, and she created a group of close-knit friends to surround herself with. She is also trying to use this tragedy to try and do some good in the world. She is now a member of Everytown Support Fund, which is a nationwide community of survivors to try and end gun violence. She believes that there should be red flags that prevent certain people from buying guns. She said that Randy bought his first gun one month before he killed his daughters, and at that time, he was abusing alcohol and his prescription medication. She had no idea that he made this purchase either. She is hoping to push laws that require anybody purchasing a gun to provide references. She said that many people would have told the gun sellers that Randy was not mentally healthy to have a gun at the time, and had he provided references, he may have been prevented from getting that gun that killed his family. She also promotes women having their own independence, their own jobs, and their own money to prevent controlling partners from being able to gain further control of them. She said that she will never recover from the loss, she will never forgive Randy for what he took from her but he does hope that her experience can help others through violence. She goes out there and talks about her experiences, what she went through, what she learned, and how others can help themselves. Here is one of those videos so you can hear it all in her own words. My name is Anjum Coughlin, and I'm a mother of Tiffany and Brittany Coughlin. My husband and I, we were having problems for years and years and years, and we had finally decided, I think it would be a best decision to go our separate ways. He had asked me after I moved out that he had asked me to move back in with him almost like two weeks later. And I was very honest with him. And I said, you know what? I don't see myself ever being with you ever again. We have tried so many times to be work this marriage out and it's not working it, it wasn't working for the last 15 years and that i think really hurt him my husband had called me and we were going through a divorce and he had asked me to come pick up some paperwork and i said sure i'll stop by after work when i approached the kitchen um, counter and he asked me to turn around and i see a gun in his hand and at that point, I realized this is something very serious and I was very scared. Um, and he, I did tell him that it's like, what do you think you're doing? And he had, at um, that point, had told me that he had killed our children and he's going to kill himself as well. 
and um, and during all that time, I also got shot because I honestly believe he wanted to kill me that day as well. It wasn't easy in the beginning. I felt like I couldn't do it. But at the same time, I also went into like a survival mode and going through it just meant taking it day by day and come to realizing that, you know what, if there is such thing as God, if there is such thing as heaven and hell, I need to make sure I end up with my girls and be with my girls. If I do something stupid, I may not end up with my girls and I want to go see them again. That keeps me going. I'm stressed out every day. Every day, I don't know how I'm going to get up in the morning and go to work. But I push myself to get through it because nobody understands that you're going through something so major, such a trauma. And I think my girls would be so proud of me because I'm going to keep pushing myself. I learned a lot about myself. I think the one thing that I did not think I was capable of doing is to taking care of myself. And I'm surprised that where I am right now, it's going to be five year. And um, I also realized that I'm not as, I don't, I don't wanna put label, but like dumb or stupid or, or not capable of figuring things out. Cause I was put in that position. I was forced to be in that position. And I also learned I am in a really bad situation. The trauma was bad, but there's people out there in this world who have way worse than I do, way worse than I do. So what am I complaining about? Obviously the gun laws need to change because how he got the gun, how easy it was for him to just decide, this is what I'm gonna do. So I'm just gonna go get a gun. Never, never, ever, I've, I've known this man. He has never touched a gun. And because his state of mind, he decided he's just going to go get it and he's going to do this. And then within a week, he went and bought another one. He had two guns, like a backup gun in case one doesn't work. One phone call, one phone call, not to me, maybe to his friend, maybe to his coworker, maybe to one of anyone. Everybody knew we were going through divorce. Everybody knew that. One phone call would have saved all this. It takes time to heal. You're never going to heal all the way through, but don't think this is the end of it, that you cannot do this. You can. You have to push yourself. You have to have yourself talk. You got this, you're gonna do this. Do not give up on yourself. Keep going, keep pushing. There are days you are just want to be undone. No, just let that feeling go for one more day. You will get up the next day. You're gonna start all over again. Cry, just cry. Whatever you need to get through that day, tomorrow is gonna be a different day. Brush yourself off and go, I'm gonna start again. Let's do it again. And you may need to do that, I don't know, 100 times in one day, but keep doing it. Keep doing it. So after this, that is all I have for you guys today. Obviously, I think that Randy took the lives of his girls and wanted to show Anjum so that she could suffer as much as possible. And it worked. She did suffer. She was in anguish for the longest time and she still is. I think that after learning that Anjum didn't want to get back together, he realized that he was losing control of her, so he decided to take away the things that she loved the most in the world. I mean, we literally heard him say it on the 911 call. He wanted her to suffer after the suffering that he felt she put him through. Obviously, it was selfish. This was definitely one of the most extreme cases of escalation that I've seen in cases like this. It's very interesting for me to know that he had no prior history of violence. He was controlling, which is a red flag, but Anjum said herself that he was never violent. She could never have seen something like this coming. Usually in cases like this, we see the perpetrator showing violent tendencies and then showing more and more escalating behaviors before they go and murder somebody. But for Randy, it seemed that he was escalating just a little bit with his controlling behaviors over the years. 
But after that, he went from like 10 to 100 in a day after learning that Anjum wanted to stay separated. It's just crazy. But that is all I have for today's case. Obviously, my heart goes out to Tiffany and Brittany and Anjum. It's so devastating to think about how she literally lost her entire family and had nobody else in the world to support her. I am happy that she took this tragedy and is using it to help others. That is the best thing that one can do when they are put in a situation like this, so I really hope that good comes out of it, and I really hope that she can continue carrying on and pushing forward. But that is where I am going to end today's video, and now I want to know what you all think about this case. Do you think that there could have been other violent behaviors that we just don't know about that Anjum has not told us about? How do you think this escalated, and how do you think that Randy made this decision? Do you think that he had planned this for a long time? Do you think it was a snap decision? Or do you think that he decided this right when Antum told him that they were not going to be getting back together? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell too on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All are going to be listed down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!